Hello, everyone, and welcome to one of the HWA's Halloween fundraiser, Halloween July fundraisers. This is We Are Coming for the Children, the Scary Truth About Middle Grade Horror. My name is Becky Spradford, and I'm here with you today with a panel of authors who write middle grade. And I'm going to let them all have a chance to introduce themselves before we get started with our conversation. Uh, Chuck, why don't you go first? Uh, hi, my name is Chuck Wendig, and um, I've written a, a lot of things, and I should probably stop. I should, I should take a break, a vacation. Um, I've written, uh, you know, books and comics and film and TV um, and across genres of, um, you know, uh, age range, too. Uh, currently, I am writing middle grade and middle grade and horror specifically. And uh, the next one coming up in uh, the fall is called Monster Movie with, with the exclamation point. That's like a very important part of the title exclamation point. I mean, we're talking about middle grade, so that will probably come into play, why that matters. Next, we have Justina. Hi, I'm, my name is Justina Ireland. I'm a New York Times bestselling author who's written a number of things. Um, for YA, my most popular work is a book called Dread Nation. Um, in the middle grade space, I have written a book called Opie's Ghost, which won the Scott O'Dell Award. And I've also, my most recent book is The Tales from the uh, Cabin 23, the Boohag Flex, which is at the beginning of a series um, that features BIPOC um, main characters and creatures of folk tales and myth that maybe we don't know and don't see every day. Um, but like Chuck, I've written comics um, and most people know me from Star Wars stuff. Not a bad well, thing to be known for. And Ophie's Ghost is one of our current this year's Summer Scares titles, which leads me to a past Summer Scares author, Dan Jones. Why don't you introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Dan Sasaway Jones. Um, I'm author of uh, Living Ghosts, Mischievous Monsters. And uh, I'm from the Ponca tribe of Indians of Oklahoma. I'm a, an author. I'm currently about to um, release uh, another book for young adults on uh, American Indian boarding schools, that era, uh, four generations of my family that attended those uh, one particular boarding school here in Oklahoma. And Dan froze. So and, uh, oh, there he is. Are you still there, Dan? No, I'm here. Okay, great. We're going to move on because you're a little That's frozen, but we'll get yeah, that situated. Uh, Laura, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Laura Sinf. I'm the author of the Blight Harbor books. That's a middle grade horror series. Started with the Clackety and then the uh, Bram Stoker Award winning The Night Housekeeper. Later this year, in September, the third installment, The Loneliest Place, is coming. And my first young adult book, it's a YA dark fantasy called The Lost and Found. So that's me. Thank you, everyone. Um, now I'm going to get started with our conversation. And anyone who knows me knows this is one of my first questions I ask authors whenever I have them together. Dan, we're going to have you go first. Why do you love horror, both in general yourself um, but also, if you want to talk about when you were a kid, especially, but why do you love horror? Well, it's it's a major part of our culture. And as you uh, grow older, you learn that um, horror is used uh, in, in within the culture. Uh, a lot of the spiritual people utilize it to actually, um, you know, to protect the sacred. And the sacred places are, are generally associated with, um, you know, horrible things being around it or horrible things happening to you if you, you know, are not respectful when you're in these sacred places. So uh, horror has a, a very pronounced uh, place in our culture. And I've, it's always been a part of uh, my life growing up. Um, as kids, uh, we we live with these um, beings and, and are raised with them. So, um, yeah, it's a major part of my uh, of who I am and my understanding. Thank you, Dan. Laura, what about you? Why do you love horror in general? And also specifically when as a kid, what was it that helped you with horror? Sure. So I'm a lifelong horror fan. Started with John Belair's when I was really young and then went straight to Stephen King when I was too young. That was kind of my my road to horror. Um, I was really drawn to it, I think, well, as an adult, but as a kid as well. 
Um, I have very acute anxiety. Today as an adult, it's, you know, the kind of thing I take medication and see a doctor for. As a kid in the 80s, those weren't really options. Um, I was scared of everything. I was scared of the whole world. But I wasn't scared of scary books. That's where I was able to practice being brave. And I love uh, middle grade horror in particular because it does give kids that safe space to practice the bravery that they need because the world is, is a pretty frightening place. Thank you, Laura. Justina, what about you? Yeah, so um, still a horror fan like everybody else. I, I read a lot of horror, I watch a lot of horror. Um, but for me, it, it kind of started because my grandmother gave me a book that was completely age inappropriate as a kid and um, as but for most of us. And so I had, I was a voracious reader. I had a really um, difficult home life. Um, and so books were always my escape. And my grandmother gave me a pop-up book by Edward Gorey called The Dwindling Party. And if you've ever seen this book, if you ever get a chance to find this book, it's such a great book. But it's literally about this family that goes to visit this estate in like the UK and gets eaten by monsters one by one. And then at the end, there's this kid who's like, I suppose it was all for the best. And so it really makes light of this really morbid, horrific event. And so for me, horror was always a way of knowing I could survive. Like if I could survive, you know, if I can, if this character can survive, you know, I read a lot of Christopher Pike and Stephen King, like everyone else. And like, if this, you know, character can you know survive this eldritch horror, then maybe I can survive like, you know, my parents having a knockdown drag out fight. And so it's kind of one of those things where horror is still an escape for me. Like when I am having a bad day <laughs> and I'm in a bad mood and things aren't going well, my husband's like, hey, do you want to go see that new horror movie? And I'm like, yes, because if those characters on the screen can survive something that traumatic, then maybe I can survive a Saturday morning at Costco. So. Oh no, it's Saturday morning at Costco. I know. Oh, we try to go on Wednesdays. It's much less busy. Chuck, what about you? Why do you love horror? Um, you know, like Laura, I had I had and have just pretty intense anxiety. And as a kid, I was definitely afraid of everything. But unlike Laura, I was actually really scared of horror fiction. Like the very idea of scary things freaked me out more. And my sister, I think, made that kind of worse because she was like, oh, I saw this movie. Called... She's much older than me. She's 11 years older than me. And she's like, I saw this movie, The Exorcist, and people are basically dying when they're watching it. They're having like heart attacks and throwing up in the theater. And I was like, oh, horror has like a way to harm you. Like it's not simply you know this this thing on a screen it's like gonna it's like reaching into you and getting you um and so i would not touch anything scary i was like i don't watch scary movies i don't read scary books um and then came the day when i was like you know as a gen x person i feel like we were very free range and no one was really paying attention exactly to what we were doing and so my mother took me to the video store where of course you had to go and get you know videos to, to rent and uh i was like no horror for me but I do like science fiction, like Star Wars. So here's a movie about aliens called Alien. So I took that home and no one was like, this is already, you shouldn't watch it. The guy was just like, no, no, you can just have that, you know, 12 year old boy, this will be fine. And I took it home and got to that crucial scene of the, you know, the little, little dinner dinner scene. And I was like horrified, but like kind of amazed. I was like, oh, that was kind of great. Uh, I, I, and I didn't have a heart attack. I didn't, I didn't die here in the living room. So uh, that kind of unlocked something in me. And then my sister later really, kind of contributed further by handing me my first horror novel, which was um, Robert McCammon's uh, Swan Song. Um, and at the time, I was also really freaked out, as I think many were, about like nuclear obliteration. They were like, you could go to bed at night. By the way, we all might disappear in nuclear fire by morning, so sleep well. And, uh, you know, here was this 980-page nightmare novel, literally about the effects of that. And also there are, there's a demon and supernatural stuff happening across the nuclear wasteland. Uh, and I felt like really weirdly good after reading it. And actually it was this weird cathartic thing. And I think like Justina said, there's this sense of like, well, these people are making it through. And obviously what's in this book is probably way worse than what would actually happen. Cause you know, I don't think there are actual demons. So, uh, something about that just worked for me. Uh, and then I, you know, I, I uh, attribute that and put that in my, my fiction and, um, monster movie, the upcoming middle grade is very much about a, a boy who, uh, is afraid of of everything around him, including movies. Uh, and when he's tasked with seeing the scariest movie ever made, it turns out that the scariest movie ever made is a literal monster that wakes up and starts eating kids' heads. So, oops. oh, I am excited for that one. It's funny. Um, the more I engage with this question, the more I realize my own 
Gen X experience <laughs> contributed to my love of horror. Um, but I want to talk a little bit now about, because we're mostly, this is mostly for, you know, our HWA authors and other horror authors out there. We're using this as a fundraiser, but we also want to give people educational experience too. And specifically, I get a lot of questions uh, about what it's like to write for that eight to 12 year old audience and why it's appealing for you as a writer. And before I get to asking you about that, I want to just talk a little bit about and give a plug for another panel I'm moderating, which is the panel about working with your library, where we're going to talk more about summer scares. But one of the reasons we started summer scares and we have two of the authors here um, that are current and past summer scares authors is because as the HWA, we really wanted to promote horror to children. Because if we get children reading horror, and there's so much great uh, middle grade horror right now, it is just a renaissance. And if we promote it to kids, they'll keep reading as they get older. And many of you already here, I think all of you said, I, because Dan said he has a book coming out and Laura does, have written for other audiences, right? So you've written for the other audiences. And it's important for authors who are watching this, who are thinking about middle grade to understand the difference. And when we started Summer Scares, we were hoping to promote middle grade in general. And then what came out of it was so popular two years ago, we started the Stoker Award for middle grade. And it has been amazing. And we've been so happy to be to help get that started and to keep it going. And so one of the first winners of the first winner of that award was um, Daniel Krause. And so I asked him, you know, what, what is it about writing for middle grade that's different? Because he writes for all the ages. He's won awards in all the ages. And he said, there's really no difference. It's the age of the, uh, the kids in the book. And I love that answer, but it's not helpful to the author so much. So he jokes about this, like, sorry, I'm not helping you. Um, but so what is it for all of you about writing for that eight to 12 year old audience? Again, because you've written for others as well. Why is it so important that kids are exposed to it? How do you go about writing those stories differently? And I'm going to let Justina go first. Yeah, so I, I mean, for me, I think you already pretty much answered the question. Like, I think without a middle grade audience, you don't have an adult audience. You don't have a young adult audience. And I think we've seen that, especially in the YA space, where horror kind of flatlined a few, like maybe a decade ago, um, just because there wasn't like a strong, like, you know, goosebumps culture. And there wasn't a strong like horror, uh, middle grade horror culture. We are in a, like a middle grade renaissance. It's like, there is so much great middle grade horror. It's kind of, um, you know, for a long time, all we got in middle grade was a lot of fantasy and a lot of like regular contemporary. Now we're kind of shifting, we're seeing that shift. But I mean, we really, as authors, when you look at those younger categories, you're really building your audience for later. You know, if you're a, a author who writes across age categories, you really want to see middle grade horror that you can touch on and say, okay, now I'm going to do kind of something similar, but different in a YA function and then in an adult function. Um, so for me, it's really about building that future audience because, you know, I'm not going to write books forever, but I want to read books until I'm, you know, until I die um, or can't see anymore or can't listen anymore. Um, and so, you know, that for me is, it's really selfish. I want to see more horror. So I, I write for that audience, but I also think there's really something fun about you know, I don't really write my books any different from any audience. It's really about the main characters. And it's really just a level of detail. Like middle grade readers do not have the attention span for like five pages of description. Um, to be honest, as an adult, I don't have that attention span either. But like, that's one of the things like I, you know, tend to tailor it to. I mean, you know, I don't want a lot of like, you know, splatter punk necessarily on a page for a middle grade, just because it's hard to get that past gatekeepers, like, you know, editors and librarians. But Kids would love that. Kids love that kind of stuff. So I do say if you're writing for a middle grade space, kind of, you know, read what else is out there, because I think you get a really good taste of how to kind of tailor your stories if you know what already exists. Um, Chuck, what about you? Because you've written for all the ages. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> horror for kids is kind of, I think, really useful. Um, first of all, I mean, just on a simple level, I think there's an audience for it. Um, and I think it's wrong to assume that kids don't want that or shouldn't be exposed to that or it's dangerous in some way. Um, nothing has ever shown that there's any issues with um, exposing kids to some scary stuff. In fact, there's uh, studies that show kind of the opposite of that. And, you know, I think there's something really useful and cathartic about kids being able to take, like in a book, I, mean, I think this is true for adults too. I don't think it's necessarily just unique to children, but a horror story is a place where you can sort of safely grapple with scary things with anxieties. I always kind of liken it to that old 
demon summoning circle you draw and chalk and bring the demons into the place and they can't get out of the, the circle and you can negotiate with them or fight them whatever you need to do in that circle um and i think this is a great place you know fiction is a great place to sort of grapple with those anxieties um you know as for how uh you speak to author or speak to kids uh, as an author in those books um yeah i agree with justina and i with daniel to some degree i don't think there's a huge difference with writing those stories like we're you know the bones of narrative are the same um you're maybe contextualizing the problem so they're unique to kids obviously i'm not going to be like well this the kid is working in an office and so the office is a scary place like you know school is, is a more contextual location for for younger kids and um you know you want to speak to their fears but at the same time i also don't think that you know i think their fears are sometimes still our fears like we all kind of understand the same scary things um there's some universalities i think you can really play with and play on uh to reach to them thank you chuck and to go with chuck and justina before we go to laura next um what i find so interesting is justina you were like you know sometimes you can't have gore and chuck you referred to it too but i think the kids want that and I do, I'm starting to see more intense, a little more visceral fears being included, which is great because these kids want that. I mean, they're watching Alien when they're little kids, right? That's it's pretty graphic. Laura, what about you? My answer is pretty selfish. I, I write for this age group, for the, for the middle grade audience, because kids are rad. Kids are so much better than adults. They're so much more interesting. Kids have this capacity for earnestness and to believe that magic is real. And it just makes them the most incredible audience. And again, selfishly as a writer, kids often have not been exposed to all the tropes that we as adults are so familiar with. So you can kind of go play with those tropes in front of fresh eyes. And that is really fun as a writer. To, to maybe be the one who introduces an audience to a trope. I, I adore doing that. Um, and, and frankly, I think kids deserve horror that's written for them. You know, a lot of us, I, I talked to lots of, of folks who did the same thing I did and jumped into adult horror really young. And they're like, well, it worked for me. So why do, why do kids need special horror? Well, because that worked for us, but that doesn't work for every young reader. Not every young reader is ready for it when they're 10. So let's give them horror that's written for them. I, I think that's um, it's kind of an honor. It's kind of an honor to be able to do it. I love that idea too. And, and you said before, you know, and Justina said it as well, we were missing those books. So we had to do that, right? So that that's not an excuse, right? Just because we didn't have it doesn't mean they shouldn't. Dan, I really want you to talk because I know when we did Summer Scares, the kids loved your collection of stories. Um, yeah. they, it was one of our most popular books. You know, people were asking for these stories. Um, why did you make sure that your collection of tales was geared toward that audience of, of eight to 12 year olds? And, and you said you're doing like a YA book, right? So did you have to think differently when doing that as opposed to for kids? Well, no, I, I generally write for one audience. Um, now uh, the, types of stories that um, I'm releasing to them will be directed toward toward that audience. So, I, you know, that's what I keep in mind, but I, I don't change the writing in any way. Um, that age group from eight to 12 is, I don't know, just they're, they're really vessels who are absorbing, you know, information in, in these stories. Um, in one way, we don't have a lot in our culture, in my tribe, I, we don't have anybody that's recording our stories. So that was important in, in, in that, but also to share them, I think was also important to share them with other, other people. Uh, but we, we just took a cross section across the United States of eight regions of Native Americans and, and did some of their classic stories. So they, they were all the best, the best of the best. So that's probably why they were so good. But right at that age of 12 is when we confront our horrors ourselves. That's when we send our children out into the woods. It used to be four days. They'd have to spend into the, the woods alone by themselves. Uh, they have to build their own camp. They have to build their own fire. And, and it's a spiritual, uh, it's a passing, a, a growing period. So 
nowadays it's just one night they spend in the woods and so they have to right at 12 age 12 they have to confront those horrors if these things are going to take them or if they're going to learn to you know to be able to to live with them the horrors of the mind and um you know and those other dimensions that we we live with and live in um i so i think that that introducing some of those stories was very critical at that particular age group um i i can't uh, really say any more about why i you know why i did that or you know it's just something we naturally do is uh, to tell these stories it's it's just a part of 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 growing in within our culture of that answer too because one of the things we all know and everyone out there that horror stories, scary stories are something that is the first stories we hear, right? When we're with our yeah. friends, when we're at campfires, it's a way to grapple, like you said, Dan, with the world. And so I do want to take a moment. I'm going to go back to you, Dan, for a second. And then we're going to go around and talk about this. I want to talk specifically about the different tropes you write in. And Laura brought that up and the different areas you write in and why you like those for framing your work for kids. But Dan, specifically, I want to talk to you about why it's important for you to share these folk horror, folk-based tales with mm -hmm. the wider audience. Obviously, you talked about why it's important for your culture, but they've really rung true with kids all over the country. Um, why is it important for you to share those out in the world as well? Well, they're they're ancient, they're they're old, so they've been around for a long, long time. So we're just passing them, you know, through us. The stories exist, you know, they're just coming through us, through our generation and and that and into another. Um and it's an, it's nothing that we you know we really control. It's there it's a living thing. It it has its own life. And and we're just we're happy that we're can be a part of of that procession as it goes. But um, I think that those are you know classics. Those are the stories that I heard. The dear woman. Um, those are the stories that I grew up with. So that's all I'm doing is is passing them through me to another generation. I do love if you have a chance to read his book again. It was a summer scares book. Um, the, the way the stories connect across any sort of identity it, they are terrifying but also rooted in their place um and in our uh, culture as americans so let's talk about other and and i'm going to go to justina next because you tend to use historical fiction a lot both in your ya and your middle grade uh why historical fiction for you and um are there other tropes you're excited to explore with the middle grade audience yeah, I mean, I always joke I use history because it's right there and no one else is using it. Um, but be, to be honest, like we are really bad at our history, right? Um, we tend to focus on war and politicians and rich people. And um, for a lot of us, that doesn't speak to us. It doesn't speak to our joy, to our fears. It doesn't really speak to anything except, you know, a test at the end of the week. And so I always try to to use something, a historical time period that maybe people aren't familiar with or are familiar with in a very specific context and kind of trying to find depth. Because I think, you know, as a black woman in America, um, it, history is horrific. Like the things that like the, you know, black people have endured in this country, the things that a lot of people of color have endured in this country and are still enduring, you know, that's its own kind of horror. But like for me, you know, horror is about survival. And if I can show, you know, younger readers you know, this is how we can survive even if there's a zombie apocalypse or you can see ghosts or there's, you know, a creature eating the old people in your trailer park. Like maybe that can like ring something true. I also think it's really important to show people that black people aren't a monolith, like the, that, you know, we don't have to be the first character who dies. Like, like when I was a kid, the the only depictions of black people were pretty terrible i mean like you know the first time i saw a black character in a horror was in christopher pike's spellbound and the guy's like a shaman from africa and not like a country in africa but just africa the entire continent and so i think it's really important to show kids that like the you might not be from that culture but there's a lot of different kinds of identities within that culture and that those people who are not like you are having similar experiences to you or having intense experiences as well. Um, because you'll, 
like I like I got to the point where every time I'd go see a movie I'm like oh great the black guy's gonna die you know he's done with his comic relief for the first you know act of the movie and now it's time for him to die and so I think as long as we we build that out people and especially younger readers start to realize that there is more that unites us than than you know difference differentiates us and I think that's for me is always why because I th do think especially with history um it's another way to lower that wall and it's just that suspension of disbelief where it feels more authentic because if you say well it happened a long time ago not yesterday like it sometimes that feels more real i told and that is very similar to dan as well right because he's using these stories from all these different cultures and showing them off and i totally agree with you justina i always say when i'm doing training as a jewish woman i do not want to only read stories about the holocaust right like there's more to being a Jewish person than, you know, getting killed in the Holocaust, even though I am from a refugee family, like there's more out there. And I love when I see books that do that. And it's great for other people to see other experiences. I'm going to do Chuck next. Um, Chuck, you know, you've explored many different subgenres and tropes and in your work and your new one is, you know, with the whole film idea, which is popular. But what do you like about specific subgenres for kids? Or is it more that the story comes to you first? Oh, it's, it's totally, especially in the kid department, it's more of like just the story kind of comes there first. Like I, you know, <clears throat> my son is now, he's just kind of cresting that, like leaving the middle grade area. He's 13 now. I have a teenager. And, uh, but you know, I, I, I kind of wanted to write stories that were able to reach him. And so um, it's mostly just for me, I know the kinds of things that he would respond to or that he's dealing with uh, internally, intellectually, you know, anxiety wise or stuff that I would uh, reach for. So it's less about trying to hit certain kind of genre boxes or trope boxes and mostly just telling the best version of a story that I can tell. And if it does those things, if it remixes anything, um, I'm happy to do that. But the, the, it's usually kind of an incidental thing more than um, anything else. Not to say you shouldn't always be kind of aware of uh the bones and pieces of the storytelling and the genres we're working with um uh, it's just not a thing that I, I necessarily lead with uh when writing do you find that there are any things that kids respond to in a different way than in your adult books or is it still just very yeah I don't, I don't know I don't um you know I don't necessarily canvas everybody to kind of find out like what what's hitting well I'm mostly just like I just hope it works please please read it um, so, you know, I don't know. I think I, I always say like, it's kind of weird, but when you think about like, you know, different animals, like we, they look very different, but like, we all have similar bones. Like there's a bone structure. And I think storytelling has a bone structure and I think horror has a bone structure. And so I do think the things that kind of work, uh, to scare kids and to scare adults are similar. I mean, again, contextually they're different. Um, an office environment versus school environment are going to be two different things, but the same kinds of things in those environments uh, are going to affect both alienation and isolation and something's in the dark. And like, there, there's the same kind of things you can play with. And I think those things hit um, well. And the more you can find those maybe universal pieces, um, the better off we are um, at any point telling any kind of story, regardless of genre. Thank you, Chuck. And Laura, I saved you for last of this question because previously you said, how you really like to play like, the tropes have new eyes with the young people. So you want to expand on that a little bit more and what you have tried to do with your books with that? Sure. Um, I, I guess what I really want to start by saying is that when, when I write horror, there are of course a million different ways to approach horror for young readers. And one of those would be to base it in the real world with real world horrors. And that, you know, that could be climate change, that could be gun violence, that could be assault and abuse, things kids really deal with. I don't do that. I instead lean on the otherworldly and the paranormal and and tried and true tropes and stories that, that have been told before in different ways. Um, because what I'm looking for for young readers is something that weighs the same as that real world fear and that real world threat, but takes a different shape, takes a fantastical otherworldly shape and weighs the same and requires the same emotional work to, to address. And so through that, I, I hope that what I'm doing is giving kids a place to work out those big feelings that they have about the real world in a context that doesn't feel quite as immediate and perhaps quite as threatening. 
That's I, I love that um, way to look at it. Thank you everyone for talking about that. Um, I want to ask about, and Dan, I'm going to give you a separate question at the end, but for everyone else, series versus standalone for kids, because there are pros and cons to doing series in general, but we tend to see more series when we're writing for kids than we do for adults. So I'm going to let Justina go first because you have series in, in both area, uh, young adult and middle grade. So, so what does works about that for you? So I'm going to be honest, we cheated <laughs> with the Tales from Kevin 23 series. There's a framing story. That's the series and everything else is standalone. Um, Cause personally, I, uh, I hate writing series. <laughs> I hate trying to carry, like, I love to visit a character and like high five them and send them on their way and then do something new. Um, so when we did Cabin 20, Tales from Cabin 23, one of the, you know, the nature of the storytelling is that it's following different cultures, right? So, you know, the first, you know, story follows Tasha who lives in a trailer park in Georgia. And, you know, it's, it's her story. Her mom's died from COVID and she's kind of tr trying to find her, her footing in a completely alien new place. The second story follows a family in Malaysia and it's talking about a miss, a sister who leaves and then in disgrace and comes back and it features a creature called a pangolin. And so in our third and fourth books, you know, one of them is set in South America. The other one is, um, you know, set in a sort of a liminal space, you know, ba based on, um, you know, Native American culture. And so like, I, I think, you know, a framing device is great because it's like unifier for kids, but I was also the kid who got all my books in the library. If I bought a book, it was because it was a birthday or a Christmas splurge. And so I never read series in order. So it was very frustrating when you were like, like reading like a Sweet Valley High and then like something happened over here that got referenced like four books later and you're like, I don't know what happened. And then you went back and read that book and you're like, oh, that's what they were talking about over there. So for me, um, you know, very deliberately, we wanted to make sure that, that each book was kind of its own standalone. And so like for me, I'm, I'm, I'm pro standalone. I, for even with series, because sometimes I forget what book I've read and haven't read. And so I, I, I'm just like, I am not the, I am not the writer for like, or, or the reader for a series. I'm very bad at them. Um, so yeah, so like for me, I, I just love a standalone and I love even a series of standalones. Um, so where there is maybe just a, a basic linking premise, um, but it's still each story is on its own. I love that, that you're sharing your personal experience and putting that into your books for kids. And that's a really good point. I mean, Chuck, we're going to go to you. Like your first really, you know, huge books were a series, the Miriam Black books. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what are the pros and cons in general writing series versus standalone? Um, <laughs> so I, I really have, I'm leaning into my, my standalone era because it feels good and not sad. Um, <laughs> writing series can be really hard. It can be really um, uh, demoralizing in a lot of ways. By the time you're like writing that third book, you're already seeing like the publishers not care that much about the second book and we're not getting sales aren't huge. And like, they didn't contribute any marketing. And now, so like, and you know, like the third book is going to sell half as much as the second book. And if those numbers are not good, you're just like, why am I doing this? I'm just, maybe I'll just throw this into a hole. And so it's hard. And then there's, you know, there are like weird sort of financial considerations that go into writing a standalone versus series, like a standalone always gets some fresh marketing. Uh, I mean, not always, but should, in theory, get get some a shot at fresh marketing, whereas they don't generally market sequels very much, if at all. Um, you know, uh, anytime you're going to do film or TV rights, if you're lucky to have any interest there, um, if you do a series, they all tend to get scooped up in the first book so that you're not going to get a new deal there. Um, even foreign editions, sometimes foreign, they kind of don't necessarily want to look at series right away because that's a deeper investment for them. So they're likely to look at standalones. Um, I was surprised I, I, when I wrote, uh, my first middle grade, Dustin Grimm, I didn't write it to be a series, but I thought, okay, maybe, maybe that's a thing that they'll want to do with it. And they were like, no, we're good. <laughs> I was like, uh, I'm both happy and sad. Like I feel both hopeful and insulted in a weird, equal way. Uh, but it's good because it allowed me to sort of move on to some other things and to have that, that shot and to be excited about it and to just uh, tell a new story. But uh, it's weird. It's just a complicated thing emotionally and business wise. And so um, it's a hard decision to make if you're going to lean into a series. I think that's important, especially as we go into Laura next, because she's finding great success with her series. But I do want to say before we move on that that is going to be the pullout quote for this. Chuck is leaning into his, st his standalone era. You and you and Taylor Swift with your eras. I love it. 
<laughs> uh, Laura, you have had great success in the middle grade with, you know, a series and Clackety was, you know, very critically claimed. It was nominated for the Stoker. You won the Stoker for your second book. You're working on finishing the series. So I would love for you to talk to people out there now too about, you know, how you went into that. What were your decision-making process and what, in the Chuck vein, what are you thinking about going forward with Chuck and just, you know, the things they've learned and, you know, will you continue? Sure. So um, the Clackety, the first book in the series was sold in a one book deal. It was my debut. And, uh, and I didn't know, I didn't know if I'd ever be able to tell. I knew Evie had more, more I had more of Evie's story to tell, but I, I didn't know if I'd get to. So I kind of had to write the Clackety as a book that would stand by, by itself if, if it had to. Um, but I left that door open, right? Very intentionally left that door open. And I think it did better than my publisher thought it was going to do. I think I think they were pleasantly surprised. And so when I came to them and said, okay, I want to finish Evie's story, but here's the deal. I can't do it in two books total. I can do it in three. So you either tell me no, or you tell me yes to two more books. And they said yes to two more books. So I got to finish Evie's story. Um, I am continuing in the Blight Harbor world. What's coming out next year in 25 is a prequel, and that will stand alone. So readers will not have to have read Evie's books to read that prequel. There will be familiar characters and familiar settings, but it will stand on its own because I think one of the really limiting factors, and this has kind of been touched on by, by other folks here today, is that with a series, you're giving your audience limited entry points into your world. And a true series, not, and I'm not talking about a series of standalones, that's different. Um, so really with the, the prequel that's coming and the, the Blight Harbor book I'll have out in 26, I really want to give readers a standalone that is part of the world that is a new entry point into it. So it, it is limiting um, when you're talking about film and television, for sure, because every book I write in Blight Harbor is tied up in Blight Harbor. And so there's not a new opportunity every time I tell one of those stories and that's limiting, but I will say, I love, love, uh, maybe this is from being a constant reader, right? One of King's constant readers as a reader and a writer, I love to, to plant in those little Easter eggs and those little rewards for the people that have come back to your world again. The little thing that you don't put a spotlight on it, you just drop it in and they get to look at that and say, I know that I got it. And they wink at you and they say, thank you. I got it. I love doing that. That's that's a really fun, fun thing as a reader and writer to do. So I love a standalone and I love a series. I'm, I'm you know, neck deep in a series now, but there are standalones coming. I love that thing in between. Uh, Dan, I do want to talk to you right now about stories because you, your book is stories. So what about that format do you enjoy and do you think readers enjoy as well? Yeah, uh, like I said, a lot of these, all of the stories that I'm doing are come from ancient stories, old, old, old stories, and a lot of them we are putting our our slant to how we're telling them, but pretty much they're the same as they were told throughout uh, throughout time. Um, I, I'm developing <clears throat> new stories um, now that. Uh, are based on our old mythology. Now, horror and mythology are two separate things. M mythology is more answers questions about how we came about and and what we call certain things and and what we like to be. It it, it. so you grow up with these characters. Coyote um, is one. He's a trickster. Um, instinct uh, there's just all of these different characters that we grow up with when we're very young the stories are very simple um simple stories but as we get older the, the same characters but the characters and the situations that the stories are developed around are, are much more complicated and and become very complicated when we're telling coyote stories for elders and for the the people the stories they tell about coyote are very sophisticated so these characters that grow with us as we grow in our age so i've been um, looking at um, developing a, a series around our mythology uh, which would be, be a, a series actually 
uh, based on our mythology, but not exactly, not the way we tell our mythology. It, it would be hard for other people to understand from outside of our culture to come in and understand. So I have to bridge two different cultures to make these stories more understandable. It's that pretty is, complicated. Yeah. yeah, that's fascinating. I'd be, re I'm really excited to, to see that. But I love how your point is, they are almost a series, these stories, because the characters keep going and follow throughout the ages in different right. versions. I think that's kind of like the Easter eggs Laura was talking about, right? But in yeah. a more natural way. Yeah, in, in our way, characters can be inanimate objects. They don't have to be humans. They can be an awl, or they can be a bladder, or they could be a bone, or they could be a tool or a toy. And they don't have to be, um, you know, they don't have to be a real, it could be a stick. Uh, so these characters can come out of anything. And um, uh, people believe, my people believe that there's life in all, all things, that all things have their own, their own being. And, uh, and they treat them that way. And they treat these things as such. So there's a lot of ex explanations that I have to do to go from one culture to the next. And, and that's kind of the hard part. Although I will tell you with kids, having raised my own kids, they're now, you know, college and out of college. Um, they get inanimate objects, our characters in their lives. I mean, so I, I think you've answered a little bit for me why kids are so drawn to your stories, no matter what their culture is, because they right. have a connection to it being kids. Well, that's so, true, and it's certainly different. They have a different outlook than we do when when I was a child, for sure. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I'm going to throw a wild card question that you didn't know about, and you don't have to answer it before we get to the rest of the questions we planned. But this was really exciting to hear all of your different routes to sharing stories with with children. Um, maybe you would encourage other authors to give it a try. What advice would you have to an author out there um, I know we already had read up on the other middle grade, which is great because we have the list of um, middle grade books from both Summer Scares and, you know, they've been nominated for the Stokers. But what would be your advice to someone out there who's like, you know, this talk inspired me. I think I have a story I can tell to kids. Uh, Chuck, why don't you go first? I'll, I'll lean into the practical. <clears throat> uh, middle grade books are shorter. <laughs> They're faster to write. Uh, which to me is a little more fun. Like, you know, I was writing books that were like metastasizing just bigger and bigger. And then like, I wrote a middle grade and I was like, Ooh, <laughs> that was, that was nice. Like I've done it. Like, I just feel like it, it happened and it's, and now it's over. And that was kind of fun. And, um, you know, I mean, I think monster movie is like under 60,000 words and, you know, like wanders, my adult is like 280,000 words. So <laughs> It's a lot of those, you know, in terms of size. So um, that's my practical advice. There's a there's a joy in writing these like short, punchy sort of, you know, treats um, for, for kids. You could still kind of pack a lot of story in there, um, but they can get moving pretty fast. And I don't feel like they're weighed down by as much sort of adult nonsense. Like we have a lot of nonsense in our heads and we have to address it and deal with it in the books. But uh, you don't really necessarily have to do that in these books. How about you, Dan, when you're telling stories for kids, you talked a lot about the different ages. What would you tell someone out there who wants to, you know, turn some of their maybe culture stories into stories for kids too? Oh, well, I, yeah, I'd say do it for sure. And and don't be afraid of anything, uh, you know, just march on and, um, and, and certainly uh, get her done. But uh, they are shorter. He's certainly correct there. So, um, yeah, I would... I uh, highly suggest that everybody should do that, that uh, are coming from another culture. And it, you know, the beauty of culture is how we all, um, we we do the same things differently. So to share that culture is an important thing for all of us. And, uh, you know, it'll bring us closer together as well. Once we, we all eat food, but we eat different types of food. We all dress, we dress differently, we dance differently. And I think uh, the beauty of life, what makes life go around is how we're learning those things. So yeah, please share, share your culture. I love that. And I think Dan's inspiration is a great way for others to share their stories. Also, Justina talked about that. But Laura, you, what is your advice for somebody who really is watching this and is like, 
I want to give this a try. I think most writing advice is well-intentioned and kind of worthless because writing is so personal and it's so, it's so unique to each one of us. So I guess what I will say, kids are smarter than adults in a lot of ways that matter. And you can't talk down to them. If you talk down to a kid in your books, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to drop it. They're going to drop your book and walk away from it. And you have to tell them the truth. You don't have to tell them every truth that you know, but you have to tell them the truth because they, they will know if you're lying to them. So I would say, be honest and be respectful. I love that because not all adults know how to treat children that way. Justina, what is your advice? Man, talk to some kids. <laughs> like, I think a lot of times people write for kids and they've never talked to a kid in their entire life, kind of what, what, based on what Laura is saying. It's like, like you can't you can't go out there and write middle grade now like they did in the 80s, right? Like, it's just, it doesn't fly. Like, kids are smart. Kids have the internet. Kids are still kids, but they're pretty savvy. And so if you don't talk to kids, man, God bless, because you're going to get eviscerated the first time you go and take your book. <laughs> so, and some kids read your book and they're just like, these are all the things you did wrong. And you're like, oh yeah, thanks. Um, but yeah, no, I, I mean, that's like, that's it. Like just talk to some kids and just write. I think we have so many excuses why we don't write. And we have so many, like, you know, I got to research, I got to do this, I got to do that. Just sit down and write the thing. Like if you don't write the damn thing, it's never going to get written. So just do it. I love how Justina let us in and I'm gonna let you go first now to our next question that was planned. I don't think you did it on purpose, but what is one of the best, one of the best things about writing for kids is they, they tell you, they write back. They I will read you to filth. They will read you to absolute filth and they loved it, but they're still going to like tell you all the things. And it's kind of really nice because adults are so polite and you can tell when adults hated your book, but they're like, they still want to have a conversation with you. And so they're like, Oh, I really liked. And I was like, you're struggling right now because you didn't like it, but that's okay. You don't have to like everything, but oh. yeah, that's my favorite thing. Honestly, like I love, I love how honest kids are, how direct and how they're just like, <laughs> they'll say something that they consider is like <laughs> a compliment. And you're like, Oh, that's not a compliment. Um, but yeah. Do you have an example, like any favorite interactions with kids? Um, there was, so I did a, a library event for uh, my first middle grade Opie's Ghost. So Opie's Ghost came out during the pandemic. So it was kind of one of those books that, you know, um, it's found its audience later. Like it didn't find, you know, like in, in, if you're lucky, you get a hardcover release and then a paperback release. Um, and sometimes you just get the hardcover release or sometimes you just get a paperback release. So it didn't really find its audience in the hardcover release, which is pretty true with middle grade because a lot of the, um, awards committees don't pick up your book until it is a paperback because it's cheaper to buy school sets. Um, but so in the paperback release, it, it found a lot of, you know, so I did a library event and there was a kid who was like, I really liked your book. However, you should have done this instead. And this kid spent like 10 minutes telling me about like how my my second and third act <laughs> weren't satisfying. And I was like, oh, this is great. And I just make this face because it's like, what are you going to say? You're not going to say like, that doesn't make sense for the character arc. But like, you know, because it's a kid. But then I'm like, I always say like, that's a great idea. You should go write that. Like take the story I started and go write that down. And I have had kids like send me <laughs> their last like five pages that they rewrite things so yeah I mean it's 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 amazing is writing for kids is a hundred percent better than adults <laughs> like Laura said they're like just they're just such better readers they really are better readers I uh work I help out at the school library during the school year and um first of all all, all of your books are popular there but I do love how if I give them a suggestion it's like that I personally did a bad thing if they didn't like the book so I totally get it um, Laura, I know you get a lot of like fan mail too. I, I'm hoping you have something to share, but what are some of your favorite interactions? And if you want to share something. So one of my favorite interactions, I, um, got to go on tour for Night Housekeeper, which I never thought would happen. And I was in Denver at my first school and I had given my little presentation and I was feeling so good. And the kids, these are fourth and fifth graders, wanted to start asking me about horror movies. And I was like, cool, we can talk about horror movies for 20 minutes. And that's all they did. And they would ask me, have you seen this movie? And have you seen this movie? And like half of them, I hadn't seen because I'm too scared to see them. But these fourth and fifth graders had seen them. And they're like, you haven't seen that? And you write scary books? Like, I was, I was told. I was told. 
that that I was not doing my job. So it was a very humbling experience. But uh, man, kids, kids are watching stuff that that I won't watch. Um, I do get lots of emails and and quite a few letters. Um, I love. I love the emails that come in where, where kids like, I've got a quick question for you. And then it's like 15 questions about how to write their book. And so then you've got to figure out, okay, how do I, how do I, you know, respond to this without writing their book for them? But I will show you, we'll see if it shows up on screen. This was the first piece of fan mail that I got. I got a beautiful little picture, um, quote from the book and I put it in a frame. And I said, if, if I never get another piece of fan mail, this is the one and it hangs on my office wall with all of the art that I have because uh, you know what, All it's all cool, right? Awards are cool and lists and it, that's all cool. None of it is as good as knowing that a kid connected with your story enough that they want to reach out and tell you that. I love um, that kids, I just love that about kids in general. They want to reach out and tell you like they, and, and Justina, and you also made a point too with Laura, like, Sometimes adults, they just want to interact with you, right? And they don't want to maybe tell you the truth of what they're thinking and feeling, or they just want you to help them get their book published. But the kids like truly, truly want to like share with you their emotional attachment to your book. Dan, have you gotten any fan mail for your book? I know you've heard from people. Uh, well, I, I, yeah, I get a lot of, uh, I visit my, the local tribes here. There's five tribes that surround us. So I get a lot of feedback from from the kids that read my book. I do, um, not in the form of letters, but by actual vi visitations. That we're, I'm in the, the reservation and I'm around the schools and the kids are, are here. So they're always coming up to me and saying these wonderful things. Do you have any favorite um, interactions? I, I I don't know. I'm just always amazed at how uh, you know how smart these kids are today. It's it's pretty amazing to me. I I don't know. I'm still I'm up in age. I'm getting there. I'm 72 years old. So there's quite a span when I'm talking to somebody that's seven or eight. You know. Um. I, yeah, I, I get. It's one of the thrills of my life to be able to talk to the the youth today. For sure. That's a good point, too, about this age group. It's a great way to bridge across, especially with horror, as we've been talking about this whole time, that, you know, the things that are scary stay scary if you do it right, right? And so those connections yeah. are easy across generations. Right. Uh, Chuck, what about you? What are some of your favorite uh, fan interactions with your younger audience work? Uh, kids are really cool. First of all, I'm, not, I'm like the horror movie thing. Boy, that is totally a thing. Um, and my kid has only recently started to kind of like get into the horror thing. And, um, but there was, he was in I think third grade and one of his friends was like, and I had just seen hereditary and he went, uh, out for Halloween with her and she was like, did you see hereditary? And I was like, uh, well, yeah, but you, I mean, you have, you should not see hereditary. She's like, I just watched it. It was great. And I was like, no, you, you couldn't have. And she started to describe it. I'm like, please stop talking. My son has not. No, no. I'm like, it upset me. I am traumatized by that movie. And she's like, it was great. And I was like, woo, like hereditary is fine. Um, so kids really do love the horror movie thing. Um, no, the interactions have been great. Kids are super awesome. And they really do, I find, want to talk about writing, not just about like your thing, but they, like, one, of, one of the most like sophisticated questions I like was talking about my book with a classroom and they were asking a lot of and i also talked about like because i talk about writing too and, and writing advice and health course writing advice is also nonsense and um the one kid he like raised his hand he's like well how do i create suspense in my novel and i was like i don't know oh no i can't help you that's too hard of a question uh, uh oh it was just like really like how do i create it was just so well formulated um and i do you know i get uh like whenever i do like a school visit um back during the pandemic either zoom or in person um so you get like the kind of the ream of like the thank yous from the class which is really cool and they're often drawings but my, my favorite one I, I don't have it first of all they all have the kids names on them uh and they were all very nice but one of them just said and it was like kind of like a very hastily drawn drawing and it just said i read your book it was fine i was like all right thank you <laughs> i mean agreed i don't know what to tell you that's probably that's probably right i you know 
I love that. I love that so much. Yeah. Um, okay, we're going to be finishing up now, and I'm going to let everybody share with the audience here, especially because we want to talk. We, we mentioned at the very beginning, you know, read other things. So what other horror authors do you wish more people knew about? It would be great if they were middle grade, but they don't have to be. Dan, I wanted to give you the chance to go first to talk about what other books you suggest people try or authors. Well, I'm, it's just not horror, I guess, but, um, you know, I'm just certainly read Stephen King and, okay. uh, but, um, yeah, I'm, I, I like to pro promote all kinds of genders of, uh, of books, but uh, definitely, um, I, I'm, I uh, do a lot of history work, so I don't know. It's hard for me to really um, say. I have a, kind of a unique um, huh, appetite for um, for information. Well, that's great. Share, that I, that share I, uh, your unique appetite with everybody. It's your chance. Yeah, yeah I, I study a lot of history. Um, Mystical Warriors of the Plains is um, one book that I refer to a lot. Uh, Dee Brown's uh, is another author that I follow. I uh, used to follow. He passed away, but uh, I read his books uh, constantly. So I'm quite the history buff, actually. I'm doing a whole study now on Indian sign language, uh, studying uh, generals that studied Native American hand language. So um, I, some of my my editor and um, agent was talking about maybe producing it for children uh, as kind of a secret sign language, but it actually comes from ancient Native American hand language. It's the way we spoke with other tribes. There were there were different regions that had different hand languages, but uh, so these are generals works and they're hard to find. And they're pretty, they're uh, American generals found that American Indians could speak with each other using a symbol hand language. And they could understand it from further distances than American hand language, like for the deaf, um, and because it's so um, uh, visual, the, the the sign language. So they they still use it today in the mil military. A lot of the signs that they use today come from uh, Native American hand language. So, so that's why I say I, I read a lot of kind of right. unique and rare stuff, but. But I love this because there could be a great idea for a horror novel there, right? The yeah, apocalypse okay. is coming and only the hand language can stop the monsters. So hold yeah. on to that idea. You could do a good story there. Um, Justine, yeah. what about you? What authors do you wish more people knew about? Um, I really, really like um, uh, Catherine Arden's Small Spaces series. I think it's it's just, for me, it's just so fun and eerie. But I really wish for me, I really wish more people read uh, middle grade graphic novel horror. And so I'm actually going to say the last thing I read, which I love, was um, this uh, Eerie Tales from the School of S Screams. Um, it's so much fun. And I think sometimes, um, you know, we watch a lot of horror movies. And I think sometimes to get kids into prose, you can use graphic novels to bridge that gap. If they love horror movies, give them a graphic novel and then we can jump them into prose. Because I think I have a kid, I have a 16 year old who, is a reluctant reader, hates prose, but will read graphic novels. And that's what really got them into reading prose was going kind of that bridge. So for me, it's like, there's a lot of great middle grade um, graphic novel horror that's coming out. So yeah, anything, honestly, like I, I read so much of it now. I'm just, it's like all just there, but it's all good. It's all so good. I love that point about the graphic novels. We always try with summer scares. Well, first of all, small spaces is summer scares as well but we try to have a graphic novel in either middle grade or young adult. Um, and then for a few years ago, we had our first one in adult, which was my favorite thing is monsters. Um, because yeah, graphic novels are, I mean, my kid is an, is, was an advanced reader and he still liked graphic novels more. Um, I think it's a great way to bridge that gap. And everybody here talked about movies, right? So clearly that visuals with the storytelling is super important. Um, Chuck, what about you? What authors do you want other people to know about? Uh, I, you know, in terms of the middle grade horror stuff, I usually have to sort of let my kid lead the way on that. <laughs> um, uh, Laura's books have been um, easily some of his most favorite reads. Um, Hannah Alcaf's uh, Girl on the Coast, uh, Ali Malinenko, 
um uh god daniel krauss's uh like teddy bear apocalypse trilogy like that goes hard that <laughs> those, those roll real hard uh for for you know that's the kind of thing like yeah you can tell some pretty dark uh gnarly stuff for kids and then it's just teddy bears and it's you know um dan poblaki's series um is really great um obviously the Catherine arden books are uh, stellar uh those are just that's such a good series um yeah thank you and thank you for mentioning Allie, who wanted to join us today but had um something come up so i'm glad she still is here in some way and i have to tell a really good story about uh daniel krauss's book and i'm gonna go to laura next because it involves laura so uh, when we were at StokerCon in Pittsburgh, Laura was part of Librarian's Day, and we were eating lunch next to each other as part of Librarian's Day. And um, Cynthia Palayo's son was sitting next to Laura and telling her stories about the monsters he makes. They were talking about scary books. And I will always remember this. He turned to Laura and said, this was great. He was 10 at the time. Um but you have to be careful when you read Daniel Krause's teddy bear books, because when I, when my mom reads them to me, I have to put headphones on my teddy bears so they don't get scared. So <laughs> that was just one of my favorite stories. And Laura was so, she's like, oh, I'll remember that. You were so great with the kid, but with the, with her kid. Anyway, what authors do you wish more people knew about? So I'm going to shout out three, and one of them we've already heard. Um, Dan Pablocki, he's got like 20 middle grade books out there. He's so, so good, and he keeps getting better. Uh, most recently, he's got uh, Tales to Keep You Up at Night and More Tales to Keep You Up at Night, and they're great. They're so good. Um, so for folks wanting to maybe start their journey of reading middle grade horror, Dan Pablocki is on that list. Um, a writer named Rob Renzetti he has got a book called The Horrible Bag of Terrible Things and the second book just came out like last week he used to write for um for like Gravity Falls and he's done some other things so he's got a lot of humor in his writing but there's an earnestness and he kind of writes some kind of gross stuff but he's wonderful and then a writer that I look up to because I think her prose is brilliant is Karen Strong and she wrote a book called Eden's Everdark that blew me away and her new one coming out maybe in August is called The Secret Dead Club. It's very different than Eden's Ever Dark, but it's so good. So Dan Pablocki, Rob Renzetti, Karen Strong, if you read all three of them, you'll get a good introduction to middle grade horror. Well, thank you everyone for being here. I want to do a shout out. I think Laura, you're part of this group, but Spooky Middle Grade is a really great organization to take a look at some of the authors who are writing in the middle grade space. Um, but I want to thank everyone for being here and just end with a reminder. This is part of Halloween in July. Yes, they're in August. You know, we're just doing the best we can. Um, and this was We Are Coming for the Children, The Scary Truth About Middle Grade Horror. And this is up on the page. It is a pledge site. Again, we are raising money. If you enjoyed this video, you're allowed to watch it for free. We are totally fine with that. But if you feel like you want to help, with our scholarships, which we've listed, um, there are some that go to young writers. There is the Dennis Etchison Young Writer Award, and there's also an award that specifically goes to libraries who are doing materials for uh, doing programming for children. But we support all authors in all sorts of ways. Um, and of course, if you look at that website, which you're watching this on right now, um, we are specifically raising funds for a project that the University of Pittsburgh Horror Studies Archive is doing. So all of that information is there. We thank you for watching. And I really do want to thank all of our authors, Chuck, Dan, Justina, and Laura for being here and sharing their thoughts about middle grade horror today. Thank you.